struggled to find work for five months, 100 plus applications, zero on sites. It was rough. When you're just starting out, there's a tendency to go into a silo, spend a long time spinning your wheels. We found work fairly quickly after that little extra polish you needed. If you're just starting out, it's gonna be a numbers game, hundreds of applications, a very low conversion rates. I'm Ark and I work at Twilio. It's a cloud communications company. They sell contact centers, a service. They do SMS, voice, WhatsApp, pretty much handling virtual communications for B2B. They started out developer focused, like naming and building developer tools. We grew into like this large B2B communication business. I'm a software engineer in the support space. So I help maintain the customer support websites and all the tooling. What was your route to get that job? I actually went to school for electrical engineering and then out of college couldn't find any work I wanted to pivot into web development went to general assembly actually I did that their 12 week immersive program in New York and then I just struggled to find work after that four or five months 100 plus applications zero on sites it was rough so I went to CoSmith I really tried to focus hard and lean in on the technical communication aspects and having been on the other side of the hiring table it's very easy to tell when somebody is a seasoned developer or not just then when you talk about their experience and so yeah going to CoSmith just like gave me that little extra polish I needed. Then we found work fairly quickly after that, making really fancy checklists for rockets launching. Now you've been on the other side of the hiring table, what would your top tips or your advice be to aspiring engineers in the job search in a pretty tough market in 2025? It depends on what your experience level is. If you're just were starting out like me, it's gonna be a numbers game, hundreds of applications, a very low conversion rates. Out of 100 applications, I would get seven interviews. Out of those seven, I would get one on site. Interview. It took me like a hundred applications before I actually got my first on site. What is the most overhyped trend in tech right now for you? Copilot. You see a lot of junior devs that are using it as a crutch. Write my unit tests, write my code. And then that's what it's perfect for writing boilerplate and things, but then they end up with code that people don't really understand what it's doing. And then they push it to production and then something goes wrong and they can't fix it. So for you, is AI replacing software engineers? No, not anytime soon. It's a tool right now. It's replacing a lot of people doing the manual labor. In my company, they laid off hundreds of people who are like manually responsible for maintaining customer relations. And then they hire hundreds of people who are web developers. There's tons of UI work, like building these AI systems and things. It doesn't really replace the developer. It gets to a point where like there are people that use AI and then they don't. And then the people that use it get ahead because they boost their productivity. So are you using AI in your workflow? Yeah, of course. It's the new Google search. What kind of tools are you using? A lot of times I'm using actually looking through internal docs. The one thing that AI does really well is actually like parse through a lot of internal documentation. You can have private repos that it's connected to all the Google docs docs, all the internal docs, all the external docs, and then help you find answers to whatever problems you have. Like at my company, the products that, that my company sells, we also use ourselves to help our customers. So it's, uh, it's really helpful to be able to go through a lot like that. There's so much documentation. So using AI to summarize and to narrow down your search, I think that's pretty much everybody who I work with, they're doing the same thing. So engineers should be excited about using AI to streamline or expedite that kind of workflow. Sure. I think so. There's, there's a little productivity gains to be had, but it doesn't replace you still have to make design decisions and you have to weigh the pros and cons. A lot of times it's not even like a technical decision, but it's going to be a business decision or it's like a matter of like prioritization or like resourcing. Most of the hard problems are not technical, but they're people problems. What was your career before software engineering? I was working in IT. Actually, I was doing full desk. So like a geek squat, I worked at Best Buy, removing viruses from computers, vacuuming desktop. Did that involve any coding? Oh, very limited. Uh, actually, even when it comes to troubleshooting computer problems the way that anyone geek squad you have a dongle you plug it in and you connect that computer to the internet and then somebody from the india remotes into to the computer and then they do all the work so all you do is you literally you like plug in a dongle and then double click on a startup script and then it does the rest doesn't sound like the most fulfilling kind of work and when you're in in college working part-time it's a good job would you be comfortable saying what kind of salary band you were at it's like 14 or 15 dollars an hour and going into software engineering 150 i think 
case, salary for a mid-level engineer, that's probably like below average. Maybe like you look at the total comp, especially with the stocks for like mid-level engineer, like over 200K is like pretty, pretty standard and higher cost of living. Like with these tech jobs, it's they're all, they have these bands, salary bands. So if you're in a high cost of living area like San Francisco, you get the highest, but making 150K in LA, you can get by like the same quality of living on half the salary. If you're in a place like Philly, the cost of living matters. So just because you're making 200K like in the Bay Area, that's not going to go very yeah. far. What defines a junior, a mid, and a senior engineer in 2025? The impact that, that you have and when you're a junior, you're more concerned with your individual contributions and adding features and you're building widgets and make updates to some part of the system. Mid-level, you have more of an ownership and to end you can ship features and you could write blueprints. And by the time you're at the senior level, you're able to not just do that, but also mentor others, help other engineers level up guiding with the coding standards. And there's a lot of company knowledge, like how the infrastructure works for a large company. Like if you're working with Docker and Kubernetes, build kites and Argo CD, even you go to a coding bootcamp, you're probably not going to be exposed to these things. But these things you learn over time, that's what separates the seniors. You, know, you have that experience and you not only can do your work, but then you also enable others to do their work as well. So how do you get from junior to mid or mid to senior? When you're a junior, you just have to be like a sponge, just being uncomfortable with not knowing and being able to communicate that and ask for help. That's key. I think when you're just starting out, asking for help and communicating, there's a tendency to go into a silo, spend a long time spinning your wheels when it could have been much better used pair programming or something like that. What is the one thing early engineers always get wrong? One thing early engineers get wrong, the imposter syndrome. Others around you are more intelligent than you are and everybody knows how to solve this problem except you. When you're starting out, there's that insecurity. But in reality, that's expected. That's what the senior engineers are there for. You have to use them as a resources and push back against the feeling like you're a burden. Who, even in this tough market and this day and age, with the tools available, with the right people to go into software engineering? Think twice. If you are in it for the money, because that's not enough motivator for people to stick through the grind. I mentioned earlier, hundreds of applications and hundreds of rejections. A lot of people that are just in it for the money, they struggled because that was primary motivator. But if you see coding as a tool for problem solving, there's a lot of creativity in it. Some of the best coders I've worked with actually came from non-coding backgrounds, arts, literature, because you bring different ideas, different paradigms, ways of thinking, of categorizing data. And then it's like those skills that are transferable to coding, especially if you're a visual person, you can translate that into code. And why is a perfect outfit for that if you have that artistic background, but you also are not afraid from some of the little more technical work. If you were getting into a now, what would you tell your younger self? More hackathons. More hackathons. Yeah. I actually, I only started doing them like fairly late. I had a lot more opportunities to, to do them, but it was a lot of fun. One of my favorite coding experiences has been my 23rd birthday. I went to a hackathon in New York City and the challenge was how do you stop poachers from illegal fishing in the marine protected areas? The idea was like, if you have an acoustic signature off a boat engine or something like that, and then being able to take that signal and then transmit that. There's so, so much possibility where you create solutions to these problems with a laptop. So using those skills and having fun, do more experimentation. So yeah, definitely more of that.